that the wall confiscates most of our landmarks. This is one of the landmarks that the wall is going to take from Bethlehem. My name is David. I'm a recently retired social worker. Um, I come from a Christian background, so very interested in theology, and uh, that's why I'm here. My name is Osama, I am the youth uh, project coordinator at WEAM Center. Uh, one of our main projects is SOLHA, Conflict Resolution. I'm Frank and uh, I'm here because I've been interested in the Middle East and the you know, Palestinian-Israeli conflict for ages. I come from Turin. I'm the only Italian in the group. Yeah. <laughs> Linda said George N. Rishmawi. I'm one of 30 George Rishmawis in Betsahor. <laughs> to focus on one word in that kind of meeting or dialogue is that it's a human to human interaction on equal basis. I'm Mike William, I live in the York area and I used to be a town planner. I'm now semi-retired. Uh, Mid Wales, originally Australia, United Reformed Church minister retired, and I'm uh, coming back here a second, third time really, to uh, gather more ammunition for the campaign that uh, we hope to wage when we go back. Hazel from Mid Wales. Um, we came two years ago and I, I wanted to find out more of the story uh, um, of the life here and see the places and the people. My name's Adrian. I came here just to see the facts for myself and meet the people. W what job do you want to have in the future? What ideas do you have about a job when you're older? I am a teacher. A teacher? Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, my name's Jenny Lynn. Um, I'm from Hull. And this is the second tour that I've been on with Linda. I came two years ago because I'd always had a bit of a thing about Palestine and Israel.
My name is Catherine Phillips and my interest in the Middle East was sparked when I lived in Jerusalem as a child. And I want to return on this tour so I can experience it first hand again and get to grips with the conflict. the first intifada and the Israeli government made this uh, decision of closing all the universities and all the educational institutions. So at that period there was no education given to the Palestinians whether in schools or universities. We have almost 550 checkpoints, fixed ones, but we also have something we call flying checkpoints. These flying checkpoints, they could be there one day and they could just disappear another day. And the, the theory I've heard against the boycott is, well, you know, academics from Israel c can do something to change the government. Mm -hmm. And so I said to them, well, for the last three years, can you list what the academics from Israel have done? And I had an experience of my, some of my friends who had to come and sleep at my house because they couldn't go back because when they came there was no checkpoints but going back they found a checkpoint and it was closing everyone from getting back. They found no taxis, not, nothing to get them to their village back so they had to come and sleep at my place. It's ringing Frank. Try out. <laughs> doing something. Hello. I just see it on the ground. It's I don't know how it works. I mean, yeah. <laughs> just, just a few hours. <laughs> I'm trying to call the... Uh, how long does it take Israeli Prime Minister? that people can come in, arrest 18 and even younger, like 14 was the, the age he gave, and then they could just be in prison for a decade. Like to me, as an 18 year old, I find it, I just can't quite understand that someone would put me in prison and I'd be in prison for 10 years from now. Like it, it just, I just, I, I couldn't understand that. At the moment, I still do feel like a child. And when, when he said people even younger than me would, would be in prison and even solitary confinement, with like no, no other contact with anyone else for no reason. But it, it, it just seemed unjust that no one knew about this. What happens is the ultra-Orthodox Jews don't pay taxes for the most part because they're considered poor and, uh, and they're exempt from taxes. So it's the Palestinians and the secular Israelis like me that have to make up the difference. What's happening is the secular Israelis are fleeing the city. And that's where you get a lot of the settlements that we'll see later around Jerusalem, Malay Adumim, and Ephraim, all those settlements are really people fleeing Jerusalem because the high taxes, poor services, and a big ultra-Orthodox Jewish community.
Petty Kolik and the Israeli army came in, Kolik was the mayor, and without any authorization whatsoever, they demolished the entire neighborhood. On June 11, 1967, in order to make this plaza for the wall, first demolition, that was the first act of occupation. Why? Because it was an act that had nothing to do with the hostility. The guy that Na'ari King has a company. See, what he didn't tell you was he works for this guy Moscovich, Erwin uh, Moscovich. And there's a website you can look up that's out of California called Stop Moscovich. <clears throat> so that's who Arya King works for. And these are the kinds of settlements that Moscovich is funding. frozen for building and therefore um, the land is kept free those that do build because they have to build build illegally and can be, and keep, and can be demolished you know a couple figures first of all 22,000 demolition orders okay second of all there are 25,000 houses housing units lacking in the Palestinian sector of East Jerusalem in other words, the city itself says there, there should be 25,000 more housing units just to meet the minimal needs of the Palestinian population. It doesn't mean they want to... I mean, it's an artificial shortage. Built inside Abu Dis, like we saw, because the Israelis never go there. Rather than building it between Israelis and Palestinians, the problem there is Israelis see it. So you build it deep inside Palestinian areas, which kind of goes to show that security really isn't the You know, issue. this wall is twice, more than twice as high as the Berlin Wall. The Berlin Hall Wall was, uh, was um, 12 feet high. This is 26 feet high. And it's five times longer. It's called Beit Arabia. You'll meet Arabia, who's uh, Salim's wife, whose house this is. What do you make about, about the wall and its roots? I, I really don't understand it. I'm, uh, like I said, I, I'm, I'm good at maps. I can navigate. I can find my way around. I've, I've done a lot of walking. And, and we've driven around. We've looked at this. I'm, I'm completely lost. I just don't understand. It doesn't follow any particular topography. It's clearly about land grab in many, in many places. But it's so convoluted. Um, it must be very impractical to, to monitor. Um, I can't see it that it serves any security function, but I can see that it creates enormous pressures within community. Just ADA, ADA, ADA Goni, but you call me ADA. Um, I'm a member of the Women's Organization for Human Rights, which is called Mahsom Watch, which Mahsom means checkpoint. Walking into that little village yeah, it, settlement. It's what, of course it's, what it's actually about, of course, is control. What are they preventing? It's about control. And, uh, and humiliation. It's not about, it's not about uh, security at all. She's a young woman married, four children. She has a blue, yes, she has a blue idea if you sh if she, she showed it to me. Where is she going? She's going to visit her mother. Her husband can't come with her. He has a different idea. Her children can't come with her to visit their grandmother. Oh, no. 
As a grandmother, it drives me mad. Horrible stories, of, of, and even of children so aged 11, Very often 10, being, being left on their own in the dark, refused to refuse through and so on. It's just absolutely inhuman as far as I'm concerned, yeah. yeah. What do you make of this? It's like someone having a noose around their neck. Please, chat. It, it, make, it makes no sense. There is, no, there is nothing we can relate to in, in our experience. This is why coming here is so important. Soldier looked as, he was, as if he was ready. I think I said this to somebody. He looked as if he was ready for the Third World War. Yeah. I mean, he got so much kit on him, hasn't he? Mm. I, and I, I just, because I, we've seen some of the other guys, you know, and they've just got a kind of a gun. This guy got a gun and a dagger and he got bits Hello. and pieces all and a backpack. And I don't know how they keep so restrained. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and what, you know, what, what Salim was seems, talking nobody seems to uh, uh, ever give them any credit for is how they put up with these frustrations for so long yes. with, with such equanimity. Yeah. really think, and I think the Jewish people in the group, and there's only three of us, but I think we really... <laughs> I think we really... Uh, I mean, it's, it's just very difficult because I can also see the other side. Uh, that Seth that was going on about it was all uh, because he was Jewish. I mean, that's absolute rubbish. Real Jewish values are humanity, respect for life, truth, and justice. I mean, I was terribly affected by Ada, mm. who was the, who I regard as the Israeli granny, who empathised with all the, the similar people mm. of an age who couldn't see their grandchildren when they wanted to, and this sort of thing. And then I was actually, it was the first time I felt I really could hardly take it when we were at, outside the the village with the check killer's um, checkpoint that had camouflage on netting as if they were in the middle of some war zone and this chap soldier who was dressed as if he was going to fight a major battle mm. In the winter, it gets very muddy and it's there, it smells awful. And so you have to walk like this so that you don't step on anything. That one time, uh, one woman told us is that when she went to to uh, to to one of the families who have their who had their homes demolished and she went into the family and she gave uh, she gave uh, the little girl uh, a piece of paper to draw on and uh, she said you know draw whatever you like and and the little girl she drew a house that was uh, that that uh, that uh, that had blood coming out from it so she said the house is dead the house is dead you know um so yeah, it, just, it just struck me as uh, the most humiliating thing in the world why should they have to go through a, a sewage works to get to like their homes and see their family and it's, it wasn't actually that disgusting down there but the whole concept of it I find disgusting and I can't I don't I don't understand how they managed to get away with doing things like that to the Palestinians Kind of a microcosm of the occupation. 
Um, but the settlements are a bit different because they are discrete enclaves plunked down in the midst of a majority Palestinian city, unlike the settlements that were in Gaza or that are in the West Bank that are up on hills or in strategic spots. So Hebron is unique in that respect. <laughs> the Hebron settlers tend to be the most ideologically radical of any of the settlers. Most of them are Americans, which is very embarrassing. <laughs> This is where the British politicians need to come, mm. to come to Hebron, to walk up and down the streets, to see the division, to see the way that, um, the huge injustice. This is not peace. You've been in Hebron for how many years? Uh, one. One month? Yeah. And, and how many times in, how many more months to go? More months than I uh, go. Okay. And um, what this is this? This is Ethan, very good guy. Hi, Ethan. Alright. Uh, How long have you been here? Here with me. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. And um, and their uh, friends come from home, friend, uh, out of the beach. <laughs> I want to be home too. Where is your home? Where do you live? Near Tel Aviv. We're now in the um, Palestinian part. Just, how, how does it contrast to where we've just been? It, the contrast was amazing, to be honest. Like, through there was a ghost village. There was, there was absolutely no one there, no life. Whereas here is you know, vibrant and full, and there's lots of markets and stuff. And I've never seen so many bricks. Man's inhumanity to man, real evidence of this. And it's, it's the, these settlers do not see the Palestinians as human beings. They're no. seen as animals. Yeah. Like I said a minute ago, I don't use foul language, I don't swear, but that is crapping on people. That is just... I mean, what Linda said, man's inhumanity to man, I can't think of anything worse than having somebody throw rubbish on me. that one day this will stop but we don't want to stop this without benefit from this relation that exists you know through this experience not only the people of Berlin was participate also internationals and Israelis and the relation become more stronger
Oh fuck, what happened to you, Adrian? No, 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 I just got hit on the back of my head. With a tear gas thing, can you have a look? Tear gas on your head? I don't know, something heavy. Yeah, you got, uh... Is it okay? I mean, there's blood, but I don't know where. You're what? Yeah. And uh, you can't think when the gas goes in your eyes and you breathe it in. All you want to do is move as quickly as you can. Yeah. We were walking really, really slowly away. There was no provocation to begin with, and they fired tear gas. Then, as we were walking slowly away back to the village, they followed us, kept firing tear gas, and just then you could hear they were firing, firing um, live cartridges from their guns as well. And there's real panic. It's a really nasty situation. Like something I'd never experienced before in my life. It was, there were literally tear gas canisters exploding everywhere. There was nowhere to run. You didn't know what to think. You didn't know what to do. Like I was sweating like hell. <laughs> so tense. So anxious. So stressed. But then you see all these other people that do it every day, and you think, well, not every day, every week. And they're so, uh, they're so, they have such persistence and courage. Uh, I debated last month with the Israeli minister that had no problem doing that. I had a question to it. Uh, his name is Gidron Ezer. He used to be the head of the Shabbat for 20 years. The guy, is he lives in security, sleeps security, eats security. What do you do inside Israel, and he's a minister, what do you do inside Israel when the Christian and Muslim community becomes equal in numbers to the Jewish community? And he looked at me with a stone security face and said, Israel is a Jewish state. We only have one. The Arabs have 22 states they can go to. That when you kick a people out forcefully, it's a war crime. But also, international law says when you create the conditions that allow people to voluntarily leave, it's an equal war crime. story of the Palestinian catastrophe, the Nakba of 1948, to the Jewish public. Because when I was learning in high school and in elementary school, I never learned about this. No one taught me. I, was, I only came across this knowledge uh, when I was uh, maybe 27. That's, I've never heard about it. I think one of the levers that is important we can, we should be acting on to try and put pressure on the Israelis to change the terrible situation is, is actually by boycotting Israeli goods. You look for the 729 barcode, it's Israeli, don't buy it.
they'll find a, a niche market for people and then encourage them to come. But the point of them is, we shouldn't forget the name gives away what the point of them is, they're mitzpim, they're lookouts. And what are they looking out on? Well, maybe we could say they're just looking out on the lovely countryside, but actually what they're designed to do is look out on the Palestinian villages in the valleys below. That's part of the reason you see the, the settlements sitting where they do, because they sit on the aquifers, and then Israel can claim that, oh, well, it's security, we need to protect the settlements, we also have to then have control over the water. them from the land. If you can stop their farming practices, if you make it impossible for them to farm, because you haven't got water, you haven't got uh, uh, the ability to compete or distribute distribution networks and so on, then you, you essentially stop that industry, that, that business. In, in, in Israeli law, there is no principle of equality. Right. There's a law that was passed in 1992, which is often called Israel's Bill of Rights, called the, the basic law of uh, human dignity, freedom and human dignity. Uh, in that law, there is no principle of equality. I thought I was reasonably well informed about what was going on in Palestine, and I just have to confess my ignorance. I, um, I've been overwhelmed by, by, by what I have seen. And I mean, for me, one of the comforting features is the number of um, the number of Jews who are actually standing up and saying this is wrong. Me is, and I can see around Jerusalem the settlements which were being built are now there and more are coming. So you can physically see what they call facts on the ground are happening at a frightening pace. And I believe when I came three years ago that two-state solution, I, it made me really question it. There is no question in my mind two-state solution is, is effectively dead. Having children and grandchildren myself, one thing that really worries me is the effect that all this is going to have on the next generation. I said how gentle the Palestinians seem and how kind and friendly. But what will the next generation be like? The generation who's seen their fathers being beaten up at checkpoints and humiliated and yelled at them and cried and said, why don't you protect us? Will they grow up to be violent? And I think the fact that I'm Jewish is really, really uh, difficult because it's reminded me of um, uh, stories that my uh, dad used to tell me about being in uh, Nazi Germany because he's a refugee and before the war, you know, in the Third Reich and they took over, they took away all the rights from um, the Jews and like his mother couldn't, um, uh, couldn't go to the theatre after a while because she was Jewish and she wasn't allowed in the theatre. And all that sort of thing, and it's really hurting me. <laughs> it's just really, really painful. I've heard the word hope used by a number of the religious workers here this time. The fact that they still retain hope, I, I find quite amazing. So it would be wrong of us to go home without a sense of hope as long as these people here on the ground still retain it.